I but agree. the minute that this thing's over, I'll I'm pay you. I'll give you a payment. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, we'll, uh, we can just pay him off. Nobody. Yeah. I should have brought like we should have we have fake hundreds that um I'm gonna be like Oh so am I. Yeah. Oh ah, an opportunity missed. Oh <sighs> blind. Anyway, so I'll introduce everybody and then we'll just go. Can you keep track on the time? So where are we now? And we're back between two edits and we're live ish. Coming to you today from the ISS headquarters. This is part two of a 12-part series called Behind the Wrap with the ISS, where we get to talk about the issues within the marine industry, the super yacht industry, that don't normally get discussed. Our topic today is bribes, spiffs, backhanders. I've got a list of um, alternative words for it. But first, let me introduce our panel. You are looking very... <laughs> panel ask. Then I'll do what? Or panel, panel ready. Panel ready? Yeah, You're nervous. Sure. Well, you can be our first volunteer. So here we have Megan. Megan? Megan, yeah. Megan Legasse. Yeah, Legasse. Now in Washington. Now in Washington. So which name are you going by? Um, In my email, it's still Legasse. So. Okay. Yeah. And will be for some time to come. Will be. Okay. And you are Marina Manager at Pier 66. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. So you've got some... You're in the thick and the throng of jostling for space and... We are. Okay. We are. Yeah. To Megan's right, we have Doug West, who is... Are you Chief Honcho or...? Yeah, I'm the, you're the, guy, the huh? president of uh, Lauderdale Marine Center. Okay. And Lauderdale Marine Center is the largest marina shipyard in the Northern Hemisphere, right? For recreational vessels. Ah. It's the first time I've ever heard that little qualifier. Yeah. <laughs> well, there are some obviously some commercial some big ones, yeah. that are much bigger than us. But for yachts, we're the biggest. Very good. 227 parking spaces for vessels. On the hard? Uh, 115 on the hard. Or roughly, roughly half and half in the water on the hard. Right. To my left, we have the new anointed one. Kristen Klein of Northrop & Johnson. Female. Female sales broker. No, 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 I, Eva. Oh, Eva, yes, Eva. I think we should all give her a round of applause, actually. For this. Oh, God. Embarrass her a little more. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. So what does that mean? You're now? I'm now a director. I'll be serving a, a two-year term. Two years? Yes, yeah, so two Right, years okay. Term. And you're doing ISS as well? Yes. And you've still got your job? Yes. Good one. <laughs> and to your left, we have... Jason Dunbar. With the best voice in the world. Vice President of Luke Brown Yachts. Been a yacht broker now since 1992. So this is a subject near and dear to my heart. So, the subject is... I've printed these out because these are the names of all the different types of um, bonuses, extortion, backhander, perks, blackmail, gift, hush money, bribe, tip, reward. Kickback. Kickbacks. But did I not have kickbacks? So this is what's great about the English language. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm going to start by saying that the world revolves on, you do this for me, I do that for you. It seems from my perspective, and I'm an observer, that the super yacht industry has a much higher value rate to this. We're dealing with hundreds, millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions. So. I'd like to understand, is there an acceptable limit? Is there a line that people cross over? And if so, what is that line? So who's got, and let's not delve too many into too many stories. <laughs> let's start with one. Do we have one that you would say that was over the line that you know of? I, in 
my experience, I think there's always... And we should probably not use names. No. Okay. No, never. But there, I'm sure there has been, and I've been witness to, but I think the from my standpoint and where I am in the industry, being at a marina, I think that for us, our biggest, we're a customer service based facility. Like that's a marina is, we get paid to make sure that our customers are taken care of and that they're happy with the service. And that's how we get our customers there. It shouldn't be, we're not, whether it's a 20 foot boat or a 200 foot boat, you should accept, expect the same customer service straight across the board. And the same with getting into marinas. There are marinas out there that have long waiting lists mm -hmm. and they think that they pay X amount. And there have been people out there who I know that um, have said, oh, the only way you get into that marina is because of this mm -hmm. or the what they give. And I am not a believer in that. It's everyone should be treated the same again, whether it's a 20 foot boat or a 200 foot boat. It's not about the greasing. Um, it's there's a waiting list. Now that's the official stance. Um, in uh, your yard, is there like a waiting list for getting out on the lift? Uh, during certain times, it's uh, yes, it's a challenge. So how do you do you have to police that? No, or we have a, uh, a department that manages the scheduling of all the uh, the slips plus the uh, the haul outs, and uh, we review it every day at three o'clock. And we empty his pockets on the way out. No, we we, <laughs> add, we make the best business decision based on um, first of all, we re we require oh, okay. advance notice um, to get hauled out or to get launched. Um, we will make some adjustments based on schedules. If, if somebody's late or somebody has, has a delay on the hard, we have to make adjustments. And, um, you know, we just make the best business, try to make the best business decision, but we do not. So it's not a case of two people coming at the same time? No, because we t we know what our launch, haul and launch schedule is at least a week in advance. We do. Mm. We have to do it that way um, just to keep organized. We'll do, last year we did almost 1,300 haul, uh, vessel hauls. So if we're not organized, uh, we would never be able to do that. It's like five or six a day? Yeah, we have four lifts. How many? Four. Four. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it quite interesting, actually? We have the brokers and the service. That was an accident. Was it? Because <laughs> <laughs> these guys, I assume... I mean, you, you're both from the most respectable places in town, so you've got to have that air of this is how we do things. Right. But quite often brokers are the ones that I hear are the ones pushing and pulling the deals. I, I think this conversation should be teed up to make a very clear difference between a commission and a kickback, because there is... Uh, okay. some ambiguity to, to what could be determined as a kickback when it is a commission. And in our world, and I can't speak for Kristen, but I have worked with other brokers at uh, n and J, and I know at LBY at my office, we, uh, the, I believe the, the difference is transparency predominantly. I think that transparency of where the funds have gone in a sale is where the difference between a commission and a kickback lie. Um, I know, like, if I am going to uh, try to get a listing and you need to uh, pay for the listing or buy the listing as a term, as long as it's transparent and the owner of the boat knows that you are going to allow the captain or the yacht manager or his son participate in the sale of the vessel when it happens, that's a commission. Now, if there's been something promised where the owner gets charged more for that, like, you, you pay... The, you pay an individual and it's not known, I, I have a problem with that. I think that would be more in the line of a kickback. Um, so, it doesn't I mean, cost the owner. You're talking big sales, but I would imagine captains have a, a kitty to dip into to get things done. So tipping or, you know, at somebody, let me take it down to a basic level. Is it price or is it um, transparency? Okay. 
So you're, there's two messages here, or two topics that you're talking about. The, the captain that's carrying a quarter million dollars in a, in a box on the boat to make sure he can get into a marine in the DR. There's a safety aspect of that. The owner knows that. And that kickback that he gives to the dock master, that is an issue you guys have to deal with. And that is, and does that dock master let the owner of the facility know he's receiving that? That would be where the infection of this problem comes into, into play. But I think when you have a scenario where you've got the owner of a 200 foot motor yacht that's gonna have a fair market value of 18 million and you, the captain's going around shopping, he may shop who is going to let him participate in the sale of that boat the most when it comes to sell. That's what we deal with on our end. Mm -hmm. That is something, as long as it's completely transparent, 1099 and, it, and it, Lily White, it, in the eyes of the state of Florida, I, they don't have a problem with that. It, it, so there's so many different levels of where cash can exchange hands. So from your side, it's from mainly the purchase, the acquisition? It, that's a large source of it, but where our worlds mix, in um, more of a way that I, again, and I, I, I believe I share this with, with everybody here in this room, where it becomes a problem for our industry is, for example, uh, I send a boat over to Doug's facility, um, like Liberty, Lady Liberty, which was the Miss Sarah, which I brought to right, you guys. Right. She needed paint. Now, it is important for me to keep the owner in yachting. If his paint job is less than fantastic and it cost him a premium, and that reason it cost him a premium is because the painter wanted to give me of the roughly, I'm gonna just spitball here, but I'm gonna say that was about a $350,000 paint job that he had put on the boat. If he wanted to give me 10% to get the business and it was $30, $35,000 that he wanted to hand to me, I know these, they know that I am not for sale like that and that that would offend me. I want that money to be a discounted to the owner of the boat or go to the, the employees to, to do a better job or to warranty the work because when that kind of stuff happens, the owner, about the third time or maybe even second, these guys are really smart. Mm. They just don't want to be part of this industry. They'll get a, they'll get a villain in Tuscany and charter and we're out. This, this is something that needs to be cut out to keep these guys happy. As uh, when we were doing the tax cap on the IYBA, the state of Florida got it that these owners are not part of the trickle down economy. They're part of the fire hose economy. It does not trickle into your employees' pockets. It's like a fire hose. Right. And when one of them turns off the spigot, it can have a ripple effect that is enormous. And these are the kind of things that become a cancer in this industry, I believe, that get these guys to go, I don't know if I want, you know, it's, there's too many moving parts between the diesel mechanic, the painters, the crew, for them to have to be able to manage all of those moving parts and know where their money's being spent, you just got to cut it. And then you need to have people that you can, um, like AJ, you know, where you know you've got a good purveyor that doesn't, he's not getting a kickback and he's getting the value for the product for which he was offered. And I got, I tip my hat to your facility. I mean, you guys you know, you, you keep a keep a thumb on stuff like that. So that's good. Thank mm -hmm. you. I've got a, you mentioned uh, the paint job. I've got a paint kickback story, if I can. Yeah. Not at Lauderdale Marine Center at my previous facility. Uh, we had an in-house paint department. Um, and we had, at the time, I think we had a uh, team of about 30. So we could handle uh, three or four boats. If we had more than that, we would sub the work out. So we had a, a guy that managed that department who uh, coincidentally was, um, he was studying to be a preacher uh, while he was working for us. So very high integrity. So what he, he subbed a paint job out to a guy, a local painter. And uh, at the end of the job, the guy came to see him and he brought him an envelope. And the guy didn't think anything about it. He didn't really, he didn't open it. He didn't, he didn't know what was in there. So he took it to his desk, he opened it, he saw it was money. So he called the guy back and, uh, told him, we, we don't do this here, we can't take this. So the guy said, okay, sorry, sorry about that. Went back, came back the next day, brought him a new Rolex because he thought he could accept the gift. It's just the 
it's ingrained in this industry that to get work, people think that they have to pay. And I'm, I don't, I haven't been in the industry long enough to know when it started, but we absolutely, uh, so we banned that painter from, from our facility at the old yard after that, after that happened, we just, we wouldn't, we wouldn't tolerate that. But was that a thank you or was that? That was a, um, keep me in mind because I know you guys are going to get more boats in here. It was a thank you and a, I want to be your subcontractor of choice. And if I give you this money or this watch, you'll think of me first, was how I interpreted it. There's a risk with that that goes beyond just, but now, and this is why when I began working at Luke Brown Yachts, Andrew Silla, who was the gentleman I started working for in 96, you, got, you, got, you lose your job if we find out you take a kickback at Luke Brown Yachts. And it's called our client pledge, and we put it on our brochures, our mailers. We've been doing it in my 20, four years there. We've had it out. I know that he had it since 1977 when he bought the place. What it does by not taking kickbacks, and it's and I, I've watched this happen. We have the Friends of LV Wireless that we put out as a memorandum to the to the brokers. And what this does, because Friends, friends of LV Wireless, these are the captains, the painters, the varnishers, the air conditioning guys that have given our customers good service, where the customer calls back and says, that diesel mechanic was fantastic. The minute we begin to take a kickback and put them on that list, now our advice is tainted. It is not actually on the best service that the customer could provide. You and get I, on that list by doing a good job. Yeah, and, and, the, and you get off that list by, by a, usually about three, three complaints. One, it could be uh, an anomaly. Two, you're starting to see a pattern. By the third one, if the guy's slow, did inadequate work, we don't go out and call the guy and say you're done. We just take him off the list. You know, you don't need to go create an enemy, but you just don't want to promote somebody that maybe something happened to them personally or, you know, their, their business model has changed. You just don't want to expose your customers to it. But if money's going to influence that, that changes the whole game. It, now you're not really in the interest of the customer. Is it a generational thing? So I know that the older not the older crowd, the older guard. This was prevalent in the 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, and they still believe it is right to this day. Our generation, we're all roughly the same. I think you might be a little bit old. <laughs> <laughs> Just the hair, that's all right. <laughs> but we have a more of um, a middle ground. Um, so I don't know, is there a certain threat from people trying to get new business or people who have had... No, I was we no were talking before, I, I don't think you can stop it. I really, I think it's as old as the pyramids getting built. As I said, that's why they're in... Did you, you say know? that on camera, actually, the pyramid thing? No. Because that's it, a very good analogy. Yeah, why is it should, building it, Giza? It should have been in Cairo. It makes sense. It, everything was there. Somebody got a kickback to build in Giza. This has been going on since, you know... So we're never going to change that. I think the last discussion we had was sexual harassment in the marine industry. And it's going to happen, um, just like in every other industry. But there's a line, and it's where that tolerable line is. And if you're a stewardess on a boat or if you're a yacht broker, where does, how much are you willing to take? So if we all accept that greasing palms is something that's... Inevitable. Inevitable. Surely there's a line then that we can say, okay, or are you just saying nothing? Nothing's permissible. I don't know how, how can we affect somebody else's business model? I, you know. When I, yeah, I think that, I think you said it there. It's like, it starts from when you were saying as white as a lily, it's for me, it's black and white and it starts from the top. It's not that gray zone that companies choose to just work in. They choose to work in there and they choose to stop it when it's seen. And um, I think it starts with the companies. It starts with the top of your company because that trickles down to the rest of it. If someone, if an employee sees someone at the top of the company doing it, working in that gray zone, then it's acceptable. Like you said, with Luke Brown, with Andrew C, like that's, it's on your pamphlets. This is how the business runs. This is how it is. It's not gonna be acceptable throughout the rest of the group. And either people choose to run their businesses like that. It's a long game too. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I look at our, I'm a numbers guy. And I, I obsess on pie graphs and 
you know, trend lines. Uh, but um, overwhelmingly, the majority of our business is referral, then what we're capturing from advertising for digital broadcasting. It's just we get referrals, and I mm -hmm. think it's because we're a safe bet. When other companies choose to work with you, yeah, like and even me, guys. and we know how you, I know how Doug runs LMC. I know how you guys work. I choose to send business to Northrop because I know how they work and I know how they set up their business. And that's what I appreciate. That's how I work. And I want to work with people like that. Yeah. It, it's a long game. Mm -hmm. It is. The people that own the boats in, in the business. Mm -hmm. Right. That's huge. Huge. So I see you guys as like your top, top of where of the profession, but there's the, the underside, well, not the underside, but there's the, the B side, so, so to speak. The, the yards that aren't as pretty as yours, the marinas that aren't as affluent as yours, and brokers who, other brokers. Um, <laughs> and that's the side that I see is hurting the industry. The, you know, the ultimate at the end of this is it's just hurting the owner. So, right. well, there's a new owner missing from this, this conversation that's huge. I mean, the, I, just in my own mind's eye, the elephant in the room here that's missing from this little. Uh, force of are the captains. Yeah. Where are these cast of characters in this conversation? And we were what trying. Were they be saying? Is there a reason none of them are here? And I, I don't. They have a tremendous job. They are not docking and running the boat. Is the easy part. It's the accounting, the managing, the manpower. It is. I. They earn a, a, in many cases, a good salary for a reason. And when you're at sea and it's calm seas, you you. I've been behind the wheel as a captain. I can't believe I'm getting paid this amount. And then the minute it's 40 knots out of the north, I ain't getting paid enough. I mean, you know, that's how fast things change in that world. But in this conversation, they're missing. And that is a huge component to this. Yeah. Would you say then then responsibility starts and stops there? That would, would be more of a question for these guys. Um, because if the owner's putting pressure on, I can't boat painted, I want to get out for Easter or something. Okay, well, to get that done quicker, I'm going to have to cut corners. I'm going to have to get people in at weekends. I'm going to have to do this. And... It's a very... I, I... <laughs> I, I've, I've experienced, um, and it's not across the board by any stretch. There are some very professional, most of the captains that we deal with are very professional people. We have dealt with a few that um, asked us to do some things with invoicing um, that was totally um, against the way we do business. And one of them we lost, the other stayed with us, but uh, we're not going to do that. I mean, that's quite a definitive line. Do you mm -hmm. doctor, a, doctor paperwork, so it's... Yes. Mm. And, and I, again, I don't want to dominate this conversation. Please jump in here. But I mean, from my experience. <laughs> She's you, terrified of this. <laughs> well, I think one of the things, and this is, this is why this is interesting, though. Too much in our society, and, and this is just my own social observation, and I don't feel I have cornered the market on this view, but within my own profession of brokers uh, and with captains and uh, yard managers and uh, dock masters, not unlike, I think, lawyers, uh, doctors, um, police officers, there are 2% of the 98% that may be villains in the business. But that 2% gets such an, a tremendous amount of focus, time, and megaphone that it makes the other 98% seem who are in a very dark world that works in a very passive way that it creates a benefit and creates this massive industry that we have of yachting in the marine industry is, is a juggernaut. The reason it's a juggernaut is because uh, 9.8 out of 10 do their job and do their job ethically. It is this 0.2%. I really think it's a small, small fraction of people. I gotta tell you, when I worked in Miami as a yacht broker in the early 90s, I was blown away by when I crossed the Broward County line this perception of what a yacht broker is compared to what it was in Dade County. Yeah. In Dade County in the early 90s, I was a conduit, like a, um, I guess for lack of a better word, uh, like a, uh, what do you, uh, like a project manager or a uh, uh, recruiter for jobs. I mean, people would just come to my desk and they would sit there and say, hey, 
you know, I'm a rigger, I do boat washing, I do this. And I just kept these cards and I just would say to the customer here, these guys, you know, they're walking the docks. I respect that going door to door, you know, doing the burning up a little top cider leather, you know, give them a call boss, you know, give them, give this guy a call. All I was, was a stopping point, like a, a walking court board where they could stick their card. And it was valuable. I went and had, uh, I broke bread with these people. They were my friends, uh, my weekend campaign. I come to Fort Lauderdale and all of a sudden the yacht broker is like a pariah up here. And I'm in my youth, we, we broke some glasses at the quarter deck because I just wasn't taking that crap from anybody when I first rolled into this town. <laughs> And, this is what, back in the early 90s? Yeah, and I, fortunately, uh, somebody who I just had tremendous respect for Frazier, a guy named Jody O'Brien, I remember one night I'm ready to pull this guy's Adam's apple out because he's slagging my profession off, and Jody just pulled me back and said, Jason, you, you're, you're in a different world here. You, you're not going to beat up every Kiwi that comes in and prove to him that yacht brokers are respectable people. You might want to approach this a little differently, <laughs> which I really, I got to thank that guy for that advice at that time in that place because... I probably would have got my teeth knocked out and be talking to you guys with a pair of lovely caps right now, but I'm not. <laughs> These are mine. But my point being that there is a 2% up here that created a, a tremendous amount of wealth for themselves by maybe not um, being transparent in what they were doing. And that tr lack of transparency, then th th a lot of light was shed on that. And now in this other dark world of our, our business is very private and we tend to want it to be that way. So it is not in the limelight, but that bright light that was shined on the very few bad in, in our profession has just been like a cancer in this world because it's, I think of the cast of characters in our business, Kevin, Walter Seeds. I mean, I, I look at Crom Littlejohn, uh, Pam Barlow's, these are good people. And when I hear people slag off the brokerage industry, I, maybe I'm naive, but I'm just not experiencing it personally. And I got 20, six plus years, seven years now doing it. And it is a very, very rare moment that I get somebody that's ever, I've watched a lack of that, not laziness, that's a whole other story. Okay. But a lack of ethics, I'm just not seeing it. It's, it's that case of the one story being the story everybody talks about. You already talk about bad stuff. You don't necessarily highlight. You think that's really is the case? Yeah, because when you do something good, you're supposed to. Right. That's just doing your job. Yeah. So you don't talk you about it. <laughs> yeah. That's Chris Rock's saying, hey, I feed my kids. Good. You're supposed to. <laughs> you know, you don't go around bragging about that. Is this part of the, I mean, I've heard this uh, last month, the doc rumor. And so the doc rumor of this particular topic is way worse than the actual reality of it. But because it's only ever spoken about in bars and small circles, it just is like Chinese whispers that escalates out of control. And you hear a quarter of a million being popped to a marina manager because they wanted the dock space. And the boat that was there came back the following evening and their space is gone. I mean, has that just escalated through people at bars? I've been in the, I'm that, sorry, go yeah, ahead. No, the, but I would say it is eternally that because you hear the same stories, same exact story over and over in a bar. And whoever is telling that story, it's probably came from one guy who heard it from one other guy, and who even knows if it's true. Yeah, it was twenty five hundred originally, and now it's a quarter million yeah. by the time it gets right. to exactly. Yeah. So I've been in the industry mm -hmm. thirteen years now, and I've seen three instances. I don't think it's I don't think <laughs> it's widespread. I think. Where were you it, before? Um, I spent some time at Blockbuster. I spent some time at Auto Nation. And a couple other startups after that. That's that's how I got into this industry. I went to work at Rybovich uh, after the Heisingas bought it. Right. Okay. I knew nothing about. I didn't even. I don't even know how to drive a boat. <laughs> Do you know? No. <laughs> no need to. <laughs> Gotta give you a car. That probably makes you a better manager. <laughs> well, I I have a different perspective than people that have been in the industry a long time. Yes. Blimey! Three instances. What about you? You're very quiet. Well, <laughs> have you had a, have you come across? I think for me in my position, um, you know, I've only been a, a sales broker for almost three years now. Um, so I'm still very young in terms of my career. Three years. Yes. Um, but um, I think for me, the, the part that frustrates me the most is when, 
you know, <clears throat> I hate to say captains, and they think that they, you know, they don't understand the work that we are doing, that, you know, that I'm working 24-7, that I don't get paid unless I sell a boat, that I, you know, that I attend boat shows, I travel, I go to shipyards, I, you know, try to stay as knowledgeable as possible about the market. You know, I, you know, I'm smart. I, I think I'm smart, and I do my job well. And when people show up and say, hey, you know, let's do a deal together. Let's let me list my a boss's boat with you. What are you going to give me? I think, Ugh, you know, you know, I work hard. You you get a paycheck every two weeks. And, you know, here you are asking for whatever sum of money it is, percentage, you know, some sometimes the amounts are astronomical and you just it's what well, they're asking. Yes. And it's it's just a an unfortunate reality that I that I face, and I'm sure everybody else faces. And you know, it's just see the the idea that a captain should be cut in on a deal. Somebody said the other day, it's fine if the owner's aware of it. Yes. So I'm going to work with your captain, and he's going to we're going to find the right boat for you, and then I'll split my commission with him. And if the owner's aware of that then there's no issue because that's where it comes into a commission versus a yeah a kickback a kickback yeah and for what it's worth there are many scenarios that I've been personally involved in that where the captain I had to solicit him to give him a commission because I needed him boats in Nassau the boats somewhere and I can't physically be, be there so it's a disservice to me and and the one thing that I I find there's a there's this is kind of a double edged sword because when the boat sells, the captain may not have a job. So that paycheck she's talking about can become a bit of a um, hindrance to a sale. Mm -hmm. So when the captain is empowered as the yacht broker, which I've seen this, and it tends to happen in the smaller boat world, where a sport fish guy, he knows the boat, he wants to become, that's the kiss of death. I've watched this over and over and over. In the United States, the average time on market for boat sales is 240 days. So in 240 days, there's a carrying cost to that. 241 and 18 to be technical. Um, but the minute, hours, uh, 241 days is the average. That's the bell curve of how many, from the day you put it on sale to the time you close. So it's because that's the middle, there's some that are in the 300 plus, there's some that are in the, you know, single digits. But all that being said, the minute you empower a captain to be the broker and the salesman, Sometimes it works wonderfully. There are those moments in time because he knows the product better than ever. Mm -hmm. But that's a risk. There can be a conflicting interest there. I'm making $180,000 a year or hundred twenty. dollars know, I get this $15,000 a month paycheck. The minute that sells, that stops. Now, I've seen managers, but when you have somebody like her and myself, you don't make a dime until it sells. I want to talk about motivation to work. <laughs> and make sure you articulate that thing perfectly and sh tell the truth in its best light. You make sure that that carrot's at the end of it and not don't take it, don't take away this honey hole by, by bringing the closure of the sale. Now that's, that's one extreme. But if you have the, ex the other extreme that I was saying where he's the captain of the boat, I'm like, Doug, look, this thing's a moving asset. And he goes, yeah, I'm with you. I, I, I love the owner. I want to sell the boat. I believe you do, but I need to motivate it. And it's funny, again, it goes back to that pyramid. I've never found a better motivator than money. And if I dangle some money and I let the owner know, I'm going to have, have I need your captain on our side. I want him to participate in this. Um, I just got a listing that's going to be in the Miami Boat Show. I said to the owner of the boat, I want this guy to be on our side. I need him in the very soft moments of time when he's going through that engine room to not talk about how difficult it is to change the impeller, to not talk about the... the you know, I want him to talk about all of the fun. And the only way I do that, sir, is with money. I need to keep him motivated. I want them to participate in the sale. And the owner was like, that's brilliant. And so it's brilliant. Fine. So we're fine. Now that that kid is more than happy to be an ambassador to get that boat sold and not in a very slight, soft handed way, slow it down. I don't mind it, yeah. But there's transparency there. Now I make less and I can't guarantee him a price because we do, you know. And that's another thing about our world. I don't want to make this about brokerage, but people think that, you know, you got a, a million dollar boat, there's $100,000 sitting there at the end of that rainbow. 
No, it ain't even close to that. You're lucky if you're picking up 15 grand after uh, 240 days worth of work on average. So this is the this is the part I find amazing. So you're saying brokers don't make tens of millions a year. Yeah, maybe there's again that 2%, maybe. Yeah. I don't know. I can't I don't know what they're making, but I know on average if you look at marine source uh it was the guys that were um Oh, they were soliciting boatyards to get a, a, a resonance of the health of the industry a little while ago. When, when I was on the board of the IYBA, they were coming to us wanting to know how many salesmen we had, how many listings, and what our average sales were. But anyways, they produced some data. Uh, maybe it was job, some uh, South Florida business journal, I think it was. It was like 32,000 is the average income of a yacht broker. 32 grand. Yeah, of the 1,860-some licensed yacht brokers in the state of Florida, about 32,000. It's not, there isn't this, now that's the average. And there may be an 80-20 rule in that where, you know, as you were mentioning, the boat yards that are scratching and clawing just to make their mortgage on the working waterfront helped a lot of that mom and pop mm -hmm. stuff out to not go to residential. But do you think because this industry is very feast and famine, you know, the yard time is a great period of rush of services and stuff to you. Um, and then when a boat comes in, it's, not so much your marina, but other marinas where it's seasonal. Well, seasonal. We're pretty seasonal. I think Florida is pretty seasonal too. And that's, I mean, the brokers luckily have the ability to go other places, but in the summer it slows down for us, but that's for us, it's our yard period. It's our time to do all that work. Breathe. Breathe a little bit. Okay. A little bit. So I was thinking mm -hmm. too, you saying in the, so your first three years in kind of establishing um, yourself as what type of person in the industry or what type of business in the industry and then you saying having an established business or knowing kind of where you stand and knowing your customers knowing where you stand because in the beginning i just hope like if they know you're new in the industry people are really oh well what if we did this or what if we did that but if and sometimes it's a hard thing to say when you're new in the industry just saying no that's not how i work like I am here because I'm, it's about customer service. It's about making sure you have the best experience. It's not about the grease. Yeah. And I've had, I've been through a lot of different marinas, but I have customers that will only, like they come to me and they stay with me because I don't want to work in that gray area. And it's just, they know how I am. They know that that's, and like establishing yourself as that type of person or that type of company I think that that, like you said, it keeps the customers, it As keeps comfort. them going yeah. and it keeps them in the industry. It keeps them, one of the customers that he goes to every marina that I'm at and he keeps buying boats because he knows that we're going to take care of them. Like, and it doesn't matter. He would, I don't, I don't think he's ever given any of our team a tip, but he's a good guy and he keeps his boat in Fort Lauderdale. So, and he goes to you. So right. he knows that I'm going to push them somewhere good too. So I think that's important. But in the beginning, it's hard. It's trying to find and people are going to test you all the time. Yeah. And unfortunately, it's normally the captains because they feel like they can and they want to see what they can do. But yeah. it's fine if you stand your ground and say, it's not how we work here. Yeah. And I will say that I've worked with plenty of captains that, <clears throat> you know, don't expect anything. They're at the end of the deal. They're, oh my gosh, thank you. You were wonderful to work with. And I turn back around and say the same thing to them. I say, thank you for being professional. Thank you for, mm -hmm. you know, working with me to get the sale completed. Because, you know, unfortunately, some of the other ones make it, you know, a living hell <laughs> to get the deal done. You know, it, you know, they are going to lose their paycheck when the boat sells. And, you know, it's... Or it's just an abrasive situation. Not, not only because of the paycheck loss, but their... Uh, my biggest, well, I, and, I, and I completely concur with her, 98 out of 100 absolutely are complete pros. And there's a vetting process to become a captain that does get rid of or marginalizes those that aren't good at the math. Is there a blacklist? Do you have a blacklist of people who cannot come? Um, we have boats that we take precautions with. We're going to allow them in. <laughs> we um, we need 
we have a big facility, we need to keep it full. So we're going to, I mean, we, yes, we have a few that we don't want to do business with. It's just they, their values don't align with ours. And it's yeah. going to just send the wrong message to the other customers that are there. It, I think you're right on this 2% thing. From what I'm hearing, it's not that. And my list is the same as his list. <laughs> <laughs> they get share, a tremendous share yeah. share this. yeah, absolutely. Yes. We, we all talk huh. to each other and that's, if there's one bad person, well, Fort Lauderdale is very fortunate in other places, the marine industry. I mean, I think there's great support in the marine industry. We, I know everyone here, we talk to each other. So if you're that bad egg, people know about it. People know, yeah. People know about it. This is that part of that self-regulation thing, isn't it? It's, we're as good as we want to be. Mm -hmm. um, once you start getting out of Lauderdale, though, say South Florida, is it other other pockets around America? I mean, I'm sure South America and the Caribbean is a bit more cowboyish for what goes on there. But here, you bring your boat here, you you bring your boat here, you sell your boat here, whatever it is, it's done in a professional, safe environment. Well, we on the on the boatyard side, we have relationships with other yards, like uh, over in in. Uh, Spain and in France that we talk to um, customers go back and forth. So we need to be able to share information. We try to align ourselves with <laughs> ones that operate the same way that we do. So there is this network. Yes, absolutely. So there is collaboration in the industry. Without a doubt. Okay. Mm -hmm. Not between brokers. Oh, no, a tremendous amount. And uh, the amount of insight that I get um, from other brokers, absolutely, mm -hmm. it's it's imperative, and we they become a purveyor of uh, accurate information. I know when I call um, up Crom or West Sanford or any of the cast of characters at NNJ, Michael Nethersall especially, when I I have a customer that says, "Can you get some insight on this boat?" and I call Michael, if it's a six, I've calibrated where his six is and my six on a scale of one to ten, ten being perfect, one being we should be diving on. When, if Mike tells me it's a six, I know that why, why that boat seems like a deal on the price point. And I, we spend, we buy our airline tickets, we fly to see it. I will get exactly what Mike described. And that type of information is crucial because the minute we get told it's a nine and we show up and it's a six, my guy's looking at me saying, I got to find somebody else who's a better bird dog for me because my job is to save time and money. That's it. If I can't promote and save time and money, well, what value do I have? So do you think we're getting better at that as an industry as we start? Because I've been told that brokers are, you know, you fit, <laughs> you're each other's best and worst enemies. You don't share information. Yards in Lauderdale are always fighting for the best boats to come in, the, the most amount of work. And I assume it's the same thing with marinas. But there is... I think we're all... On, on, the, on the yard and marina side, we're all fighting to get the boats there. But um, I speak to almost every other yard in South Florida on a regular basis. We actually just had a group um, in into our facility two weeks ago to talk about how do we standardize, standardize some of the uh, requirements that we require from um, the contractors that are doing work in here to make sure they're real companies, that they're gonna offer a warranty, that they're gonna offer um, a fixed price, and they're gonna provide a schedule up front so that the boat can plan their time properly. Because you're kind of like a seal, aren't you, of approval? Oh, my paint job is... Where did well, you get it done? Oh, LMC. It wasn't you. It wasn't us, but yeah, where did you get it done? At Lauderdale Marine Center. So we have to be very um, careful in the companies that we allow to do work in there because it's a reflection on us. So the companies you don't allow, where do they go? Um, there are places. <laughs> <laughs> there are places. So maybe it's, maybe we've got two good people here. Maybe we need some more, um, so, well, well cool. ecosystems come in to, or economic systems come into it because there are different ones in the boat world, especially. You've got the stratosphere of boats that exist in the um, 50 million and up world. And that may be where, um, you know, even what I've, I've had been fortunate enough to play in that a little bit in the last couple of years. And even then the camaraderie and sharing of information because I think the, the, the clientele is so thin, the probability of a sale is so rare that the guys that have had longevity in doing it 
uh, with the exception of maybe one or two, have been tremendously honest. And and uh, even though they may, have, they're, I, you know, I just I had very good fortune personally in getting good information uh, about what I needed to do to provide my clients with good information. Uh, you know, what is the fair market value of the boat? And and again, I don't want to. Any captains out there, I love you guys. <laughs> I, I, I want to make sure you understand this. Um, if you need a kidney. <laughs> but one of my biggest problems is um, intrinsic value. Uh, the Where the butting of the heads in our world comes, a captain who's taking care of his boat, did the paint job, he looks at it, goes on Yacht World, Googles, and says, wow, all these other boats are asking 10 million. I just put five into mine. Well, that gross investment theory that now he's got a $15 million boat is something I've got to butt heads with because those $10 million boats will on average sell for about 28% less than what they were really asking. And that, that has a gravity that's going to pull that down. He's only going to get a portion of that back. That conversation can be kind of abrasive <laughs> when you sit there and say to this guy, your baby that you have kept, that you've just told this owner, you guaranteed him X amount of dollars on a return. That ain't going to happen. I mean, we're going to put the guy in a Viking funeral, push him out. That's the only way he's going to get rid of his boat if you're going to want to have that kind of a price. And then you see this guy with the carrying cost. It cost of that boat cost three million a year to carry. And because he listened to that advice of intrinsic value, now four years later, if he would have given the boat away, it would have made more money than it will when he sells it for what we told him to four years later after he's carried it at three million a year. This is a problem. Yes. Well, that, 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 having that explained to me. You can start seeing where everyone's motivations are. You know, you go back to the back pages of um, BI, and you just see fifty pages of boats being sold for money. That's unrealistic. You say nothing sells for what it's being. Yeah, nothing and, sells and for we have two. Ma- you have the same master giving two orders that are very different orders, and there is a separation there. He says to the captain, "You make sure that boat is as spotless as possible," and he says to me, "You make sure you get it rid rid of it as fast." and for the most money as possible. There can be some problems there. You know, I need three days before, you know, I need at least 24 hours before you get invited. I don't have 24 hours. This couple just got off uh, another boat and we've got uh, the serendipitous showing here. They're very qualified. This is their fourth boat. Don't take off the covers. I need to get, no, you're not allowed on the boat. I'm telling you, buddy, this is a real viable (laughs) client here. I don't even need you to show up. No, it's my job. These are the types of problems that if you don't have a good symbiotic relationship, the owner suffers. Um, and uh, I, I, we're getting a little off topic here because there really is no kickback in this scenario, but it is just to explain that we do have different worlds. And, and in the broker world, as you get to the smaller price point of boats, I think they bookend each other. When you get the tens of thousands of dollars of boats, you have guys that make very little money on lots of sales in a very small area. This has been my social observation. So they don't need to cooperate as much. If I've got a buddy that wants to buy a 37 foot center council and it's uh, used 50 grand, I call about five or six of these brokers that are in that world. They may not be real cooperative with me because they don't want to share that little piece of pie for 3,500 bucks that they might make on the sale of that boat. You have the same thing in the possible $100 million there are only two or three clients up there, you may also get pushed back because I, I don't even know if they have the listing or the, it's a, it's just such a rarity. But this massive amount, that's 1% on one side and 1% on the other side. But the, the other 98% in the middle that's dealing with the majority of the bell curve of boats, they're just fantastic. I mean, they really are. They just help you make uh, the, get insight onto the value. If the broker himself has intrinsic value issues where he thinks his $10 bill is worth 12, that's a whole other problem. You know, you've got to solve that. But um, normally you'll get insight as to the engine conditions, the dark history of the boat, the, what you and your client will see, and it's very honest. And that, that, I think, is what keeps us alive, the fact that we can do this for customers. It does seem like honesty and transparency is a much better formula for, God, I've got to put a statement together. For longevity in the industry. Long game. Yeah. Transparency is huge on our side as well. Mm-hmm. Understanding what the total amount of the bill is going to be when they leave before they get there is critical. Yeah. 
but then also realizing, I think that, and I think you pretty much touched upon it, that for me as a Marina, ooh, my microphone, sorry. We're not always, we're not, we're not always going to be the perfect fit for everyone, whatever reason that may be. But we just want to make sure that if we're not the perfect fit, let, let us help you find it. Or how do we make it so you stay in the industry? Because there are people who you may not like how someone runs their marina, but that's the marina because you like X, Y, and Z. And mm -hmm. so it's just making sure that people stay and they're and transparent evolves. about we, it. This city looked at getting rid of all of its anchorages when uh, back in 08, um, I was fortunate enough mm -hmm. to be brought on the Marine Industry Association's board, the MIASF. Mm -hmm. And there was a push, and I and I hand it to you guys, the, the MIASF saw this explosion of mega yachts. And I mean, I, Doug, you weren't part of this world in the late 80s, early 90s, mm -hmm. but there was no 100-foot yachts at the Fort Lauderdale Boat Show. Now a 100-foot yacht, if you know, it's kind of marginalized. That's, yeah. you, you can disappear in that show. Not even a super yacht. No, but when the first 100-foot <laughs> hatteras showed up, we got down to that Bahia Mar dock, and I remember standing next to a group of guys from a bunch of other, and we were like, it's here. Oh my God, this, it, 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 you know, this this is a hundred foot hatters. That's out of fiberglass. I mean, we, I just couldn't believe it. I don't know if I'd even find one now in the show because it's so, it was, it's so marginalized, but the MIASF saw this, and in part of developing to cater to this, they thought, let's get rid of the morning balls. And I remember sitting in that board meeting going, oh my God, I just thought of the last six guys I sold boats to, and each one of them got into boating by taking being on a boat with their uncle, dad, or grandpa coming down the ICW 20 years earlier and hanging out in our anchorages. Because that's that was now that guy hit a dot com buzz, and now I'm selling him a two million dollar Marlowe. Right. And it was like, if you take away that kid's experience, and I, at the time I was 37, so I'm thinking to myself, I got another 20 years in this. That kid's sitting on an anchorage right now that's about to invent Tinder. And I gotta have him on my boat. You know, I, I, he's he's my future. And that got dicey because they were, the city wanted to pull him. MIASF gave their endorsement, and it was like scary that that was gonna disappear. And thank God it didn't. But that can happen. This that is very trendy. Ball thing changed how people boat. Is what you're saying? Oh yeah, it, it's a it's my it, my tickler. It gets people into it. It gets them to say, I love this man. I, you know, waking, makes it easy. Yeah, it, it makes it affordable. Um, it just does. Yacht club logic can sometimes destroy people in the business. You know, you don't go buy a uh, Catalina or a Sea Ray. That, that the, you don't want one. That'll embarrass you. <laughs> but <laughs> those boats have put more guys from Chicago and Pittsburgh with two point three children on the water that one of those kids ended up becoming an industrial giant, and now. He's building an ocean cup. That's our farming ground. We're running out of time. So is there a line or is it just transparency? Because I, I don't, I'm, I'm sort of seeing that you guys are working as a team. Although you're all doing your individual parts as an industry, you are an industry. I know Colin doesn't like calling it an industry. You want a market? Colin's in his own world <laughs> <laughs> but we are we are, it seems like at this level it's a it's a co it's a co it's not a co-op it's a co -op, it's a cooperative industry there's a lot of collaboration especially in south florida between the different companies even in different segments of the business and that's why you come to south florida i think so there's not even a close second to us hong kong's the closest to number of boat sales to uh, South Florida, but it's a distant second, and the boats Hong are much Kong. smaller. Yeah, it's much smaller. It's a lot of commercial junks and things junks, like that. Yeah. But uh, we're king. We are a juggernaut. If you want to get a boat sold, you. I mean, in, in the private, in the pleasure yacht world, there's not even a close second to us. We're it. It's in that as an industry, in the billions. Yeah. Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you. Uh, again, it's one of those things that the problem's not as bad as you think it is. We should get some. Um, we should get some people who are black out their faces. And <laughs> oh, with the voice thing, so <laughs> yeah. yeah. fantastic. <laughs> See what? <laughs> but I mean, to some degree, to we just shine the light on something <laughs> that is again doesn't merit the light being shined on it. And we're what we just described is a bad thing to do. We just did, <laughs> you know. 
I mean, really, you should uh, the, get some boat owners in here, and I'm sure they would have similar stories about crazy chefs and yeah. fancy stories. But but stories is what makes it fun. <laughs> so having a chef that was I don't know a prima donna or a psychopath or something like that that's a I wouldn't say it's a positive thing, but it's a story that rallies people around. I don't no. Know. <laughs> I like it when they feel strong. My weekend last weekend was showing octogenarians boats, and their sixty-year-old daughter was pushing the deal. And I'm watching them walk through these uh, four million sixty-year-old daughter. Yeah, pushing her parents through the boats, and I'm sitting here thinking we need flush deck. You know, just some dots you think in your head to accommodate the older folks who are having troubles. And at one point, I thought to myself, this, they, they've missed the boat. You know, they've owned boats. They built a, a very large yacht with John Todd years ago, Big Burger, which is a qualifier in our world. I mean, that's, you know, a pedigree. But I thought they're done. And the daughter looked at me and I said, you know, maybe, maybe this isn't the right thing. Maybe just a couple charters uh, where there's some handicap. And she goes, no. She goes, they don't own a boat. I lose them in five years. They own a boat. I got another 10 years out of them because they, since they sold their burger, She's watched their health depreciate because they're not climbing up steps. They're not walking around the side decks. This was the daughter. She, she goes, I need to get my mom in that engine room. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to go down and play catcher. <laughs> because, and the mom got down in there and this eight-year-old lady sitting there trying to get to see where the impellers are, wants to look at the motor mounts. And I get it. It's going to keep them alive. They just feel stronger. That salt water in the nose. Uh, there's a, it's a reason. You, the, the food is better. The your love affair is better. It's just better on a boat. I don't know why, but I spend my entire life on boats. The minute I get a vacation, we go boating. I can't I go to Boston. We rent a boat. We go to Columbia. We rented a boat and it's the best part of my vacation. It is what it is. Yeah. Cool. Anybody got anything else to add? I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's about it. I've put, we can go off camera now. I've heard that there are brokers in this town who won't even come into the same building as other brokers. They might have had a bad relationship with them. You get greedy when, like I said, in that thin air world, he wants to buy a $40 million yacht. Of the, what would you say, 35, 40 guys that play